Chapter Eight of King and Parliament by George Henry Wakeling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. James the Second, sixteen eighty five to sixteen eighty nine. James came to the throne as the hero of a victory which others had won. The Whigs were crushed. The attack on hereditary right was now but an episode in the discredited movement, the cry of a fallen party. The reaction in favor of monarchy was as complete at the end of Charles's reign as it had been in 1660. Indeed, it was in a sense stronger, for it was the result of a double lesson. The threats of the exclusionists had reminded men of the anarchy of the rebellion, yet this reaction was not at bottom so much in favor of the crown as for the cause of peace louis the fourteenth was now paramount in europe all other nations saw a menace to their safety in his illimitable claims and his unscrupulous raids pope and emperor alike longed to check him and one stern young prince had long ago set his face like a flint toward the french frontiers and meant to stem the tide of conquest william of orange had a double interest in england to her he looked as champion of dutch independence for that assistance against france without which his determination to die on the last dyke was likely to be realized to her he looked as the princess mary's husband for a kingdom whose resources he might use when his wife should in due course become queen the new king was fifty-two years old he was a hard worker a man of business, an experienced soldier, sailor, and administrator. He was without the lazy hesitancy of his grandfather and lacked the noble resignation of his father, while he possessed to the full the obstinate belief in the Stuart mission, which had clogged the one and ruined the other. Moreover, he had developed the Stuart want of tact quite as much as his brother had avoided it, in fact, he had a great deal of experience with none of its fruits. No character could make a man more unfit to be a king. When he persisted in a wrong course, it was with a blind infatuation. What then was he likely to do with the grand opportunity to which he succeeded? He reigned barely four years. In that short time he managed to alienate the Church of England, which had preached divine right and non-resistance for nearly a century, to restore the Whig party to a supremacy which lasted for upwards of eighty years, and finally to uproot his own dynasty from its firm hold in the hearts of the English people. Under James the fear of a popish king vanquished the fear of a civil war. The reason is to be sought like the clue to most of the seventeenth-century problems in religion. James was a bigoted Roman Catholic, and while he persecuted to the death Presbyterians in Scotland, he determined to remove all restrictions on the political and religious position of the Roman Catholics in England. The laws which had been passed against nonconformists of all sorts fell into two clear divisions. First, the penal laws, which forbade and punished the exercise of their religion. Secondly, the tests, which refused them all political and military office, unless they denied by word and deed their dearest beliefs. The former involved religious persecution, the latter political death. The penal laws might perhaps in a short time have been mitigated, for they were cruel and bloody, and many enlightened men disliked them. Meanwhile, there would have been little difficulty in using the prerogative of dispensing to pardon those who were threatened with the more terrible punishments. Gradually, men would have learned that punishment for religious opinion is no part of man's duty to man or to God. But the tests, on the other hand, were considered by the majority, in the case of the Roman Catholics, as necessary for the national safety, and in the case of Protestant dissenters, as a useful means of keeping enemies out of power. James's attempts to break down the barriers which divided his co-religionists from the best and highest places in the land are the main feature of his reign. Like Charles, he relied on Lewis's gold and on an army, but unlike Charles, he had no idea what things were possible and what were not. 
james pursued his schemes till an exasperated nation called and welcomed his nephew and son-in-law to deliver it then he fled no doubt toleration was a good object but englishmen had reason to distrust roman catholics who aimed at supremacy and had perpetually endeavoured since the reformation to overthrow the government by conspiracy or by open force when james found the nation resolute against his plan he endeavoured to carry it out against their will and their laws thus the revolution which ensued turned on the old question is the king a personal ruler and above the law of the land this question was at last to be answered in the negative the first and only parliament of the reign was strongly loyal but james was to find it still more strongly allied with the existing form of church government the king promised to maintain the church and keep the laws but had already received a large present from louis and informed that king's envoy that he relied on his master's help parliament voted a large increase of the royal revenue though james had been taking ungranted customs there was but one member who raised his voice in opposition to the crown and he gained no supporters already a rebellion had occurred in scotland archibald earl of argyle son of the great covenanter who had been beheaded in sixteen sixty had landed in the western highlands early in sixteen eighty five to rouse his countrymen in defence of their religion but the scheme was badly organised and the rising was easily suppressed a far more dangerous foe was now in arms in the south the duke of monmouth the natural son of the late king had been living in holland where he was surrounded by many refugees of the old exclusion and whig party relying on his undoubted popularity in england he now landed at lyme regis june sixteen eighty five and declared for a free parliament and relief of dissenters he received no support from the prince of orange who was not likely to compromise his future by such a scheme at taunton the invader was proclaimed as king but after a brief moment of success his followers were cut to pieces on sedgemoor july sixth he was captured and executed after a piteous appeal to his uncle's mercy his adherents and all who had been concerned in the rising were cruelly punished by the soldiers of colonel kirk and the judicial murders of chief justice jeffreys who conducted the memorable bloody assize in the southwestern counties with reckless bloodthirstiness this complete victory was a new advantage for the crown monmouth had corroborated the suspicions of those who feared the brisk boys of shaftesbury and a third object lesson had thus confirmed the loyalty of all moderate men but james drew the wrong lesson from his easy victory he was able indeed to increase his army as a measure of security but when in november sixteen eighty five the second session of parliament opened it was found that halifax whose tongue had saved the king in the exclusion debate had already been dismissed from office james had appointed roman catholics to military posts from which they were excluded by the test act and now announced to parliament his intention to keep them there halifax had refused to vote for the repeal of the act and james meant to get that repeal from a parliament of zealous churchmen this proved to be quite impossible and thus the most loyal parliament a Stuart ever had was prorogued as it proved never to meet again yet there was no sign that the king would moderate his course his chief advisers were roman catholics father petre a jesuit tyrconnel a reckless irish noble and others there were not wanting men who while agreeing with james hoped he would not rush headlong to his ruin by attacking the church many moderate roman catholics were anxious to see him hold back and lawrence hyde earl of rochester his own brother-in-law a strong tory and churchman led a milder court party but already there was forming an opposition among men who were not inclined to take the royal assurance that promises should be kept as a sufficient national security halifax devonshire and compton bishop of london led this party thus we may say there were three divisions the jesuit cabal the moderate court party and the opposition 
the meaning of roman catholic toleration and the reliance to be placed upon royal promises were being illustrated just now in france where louis in 1685 rescinded the edict of nantes which had given security to french protestants for nearly a hundred years this was unfortunate for james since it quickened the sympathies and the fears of englishmen the infatuated king meanwhile determined to prevent parliament from meeting till he had a better opinion of their intentions and to enlighten them he determined to get his power to dispense with the test act recognized in a court of law after carefully packing the bench of judges with men whose servility was beyond suspicion the king was gratified by a favourable verdict it was a bogus case the servant of a roman catholic officer sir edward hales was induced to sue him for damages which any informer could obtain by proving that the act had been broken the king had by a dispensation given hales leave to break the law thus the question to be decided was whether such a dispensation was a valid defence in law against the claim for the informer's reward it was decided by the judges in words which made the king a present of the english constitution that the dispensation was quite valid this dispensing power was certainly legal but charles the second had been warned by parliament that it was not looked upon with any favour and james was using it to accomplish an object which he had not dared to ask from parliament rather than to mitigate the severities of the ordinary laws it had been frequently used to save men from the rigours of the penal laws but now it was openly used to evade the tests a few days later another blow was struck at the constitution as defined by parliament a court of ecclesiastical commission much resembling that which had been abolished in sixteen forty one was set on foot james wished to punish bishop compton for refusing to suspend the dean of norwich who had contrary to royal orders preached against the roman catholic faith the powers granted to this royal commission were the old spiritual powers wrested from the pope by henry the eighth james was not afraid to put back our history for one hundred and fifty years by using them to further the papal cause against the laws of england compton was suspended from his sacred functions such open measures were not tamely acquiesced in and least of all by the suspended bishop who was not of a submissive turn of mind riots occurred in london and the short-sighted king established a large camp of soldiers under carefully chosen popish officers on hounslow heath to keep his capital in awe a futile attempt to bend the scots parliament to that submission which he could no longer at the moment expect from england failed to show the king the folly of his course and the beginning of sixteen eighty seven found him still determined to go on the hydes clarendon eldest son of the famous chancellor and rochester were dismissed from office as they were not to be induced to change their religion clarendon who had been lord lieutenant of ireland was succeeded by the rampant romanist tyrconnel this pointed clearly to the complete triumph of the jesuit party at court but it was also the beginning of a great change of policy the king had tried to get his way with parliament and with the moderate party represented by tories and high churchmen he now determined to dissolve parliament and rely on the dissenters rather than on the church party it was hoped that if he offered them toleration they would be prepared to assist him against the church by letting him raise roman catholics as well as themselves to civil and military office for the dissenters could not be expected to love the church whose persecuting sons had shaped the clarendon code of sixteen sixty four james also calculated that the church pledging to the doctrine that it was sinful to resist the king might be insulted with impunity though it might sulk it would he thought never rebel in accordance with this new plan the famous declaration of indulgence was issued on april sixteen eighty seven the penal laws and tests were alike suspended the parliament would not repeal them so the king did so himself roman catholics and protestant dissenters were relieved of their civil disabilities and allowed the free exercise of their religion charles the second in sixteen seventy two had only dared to suspend the penal laws and had been compelled to give up the attempt <laughs> 
james had gone further and in defiance of the clearest expression of the national opinion had set himself against the most rooted prejudices of his people the question seemed no longer to be whether there should be toleration but whether there should be laws at all all now depended on the attitude of the protestant dissenters if they were willing to accept a toleration which the king's whole life proved to be insincere because it suited him then the cause of church and law might fall together some of the leading dissenters such as william penn the quaker were closely allied with the king but many notable presbyterians especially baxter were not likely to believe in the royal promises or desert the cause of national liberty for a momentary relief halifax who had the keenest intellect of the day issued a pamphlet showing that the dissenters who were to be hugged now that they might be squeezed later on were not the king's choice but his refuge he implored them not to accept a brief against magna carta and destroy all laws in order to get relieved of one they had a better chance he urged by waiting till the next probable revolution the dissenters were true to the cause of liberty and in large numbers refused to show their preference of infallibility to liberty by way of attacking the english church in its most vital source the king next proposed to place his religion on an equality with anglicanism in the universities the laws forbade men to hold college preferment without taking the oath of supremacy and other tests already roman catholic heads had been appointed to two oxford colleges university and christ church and the vice-chancellor at cambridge suspended for refusing to grant a degree to a monk in the summer of sixteen eighty seven james insisted that the fellows of magdalen college oxford should elect as their president his nominee when they resisted he secured their expulsion and turned the college into a popish seminary preparations were now made for a parliament in which the king by packing hoped to secure a majority for his schemes but the attempt to obtain promises and subservient candidates was a failure and the astute halifax came forward to show that the king's promise to substitute some other guarantee for the present laws against roman catholics was not an equivalent since if he did not respect laws which were already made he would not respect laws which were yet to be made the royal anger was preferable urged this writer to the national ruin in the year sixteen eighty eight came the two events which strained the loyalty of the nation beyond its limits the king's order in council may sixteen eighty eight that the declaration should be publicly read in church nerved the bishops to a memorable resistance the birth of an heir to the throne in june led all classes of englishmen to look oversea to holland for help since a peaceful change upon james's death was no longer possible after the appearance of a popish heir sancroft archbishop of canterbury and six bishops after a meeting at lambeth signed a petition to james against his order in council relying upon their determination to resist clergymen in all parts of the country had refused to read the declaration in compliance with that order james was furious at this manifestation of hostility where he had expected obedience and determined to prosecute the seven bishops for addressing a false malicious and seditious libel to their king after a trial watched with breathless interest by the entire nation they were acquitted it was argued by summers a young whig lawyer that the subject had a right to petition the crown and that the document in question was neither false nor malicious nor seditious nor a libel the manifestations of delight with which the verdict was greeted in london and the country would have been sufficient warning to most men even the soldiers at hounslow threw up their hats almost at the same moment a letter was sent to william of orange inviting him to come and deliver the land from the galling bonds of a popish prince a few leading men devonshire compton russell and others signed this letter and promised a favourable reception the task was not an easy one for william the little prince was not believed to be the son of james and his queen but apart from the revolutionary movement which the deposition of a tyrant and the dispossession of his heir involved there were other difficulties william could not risk a battle between english soldiers and dutch troops 
which would have stirred the patriotism of all people against a foreign invasion he could not leave his loved french frontiers at the mercy of the dragoons of louis the fourteenth he was not sure that tories in england would combine with whigs to dispossess a monarch whom they considered as the lord's anointed he could not reckon on supplies from the dutch burghers many of whom had no great love for his name and his house yet for william the chance had come james could go no further and the iron was hot he determined to strike louis who wished to keep james above water lest england should be united and strong enough to interfere abroad was nevertheless short-sighted enough to send just at the wrong moment all his forces to attack the districts of the upper and middle rhine thus relieved the whig deliverer landed at torbay november fifth sixteen eighty eight james had made some efforts at conciliation but to little purpose the bishops refused to exhort the nation not to resist their king in a short while the invader was joined by the foremost whigs and a large part of the army under the influence of churchill the future duke of marlborough who had been sent to salisbury to oppose william deserted the royal cause as the invader drew nearer london james after sending his wife and child to france endeavoured to follow them but he was captured and brought back to the capital william had not claimed the kingdom but had merely declared in favour of a free parliament and toleration with the maintenance of the tests and other bulwarks against popery nothing was settled though bloodshed had been avoided the next step was critical it was an anxious moment for all james was told that he could not stay in london and was allowed to select a place of refuge he chose rochester and promptly fled thence to france this altered the character of the revolution tories who held that no violence to a king was possible would have been relieved from many scruples if they could honestly have considered that james had vacated his post but it was obvious that he had been obliged to go and it was no secret that he was in fear of personal violence thus the revolution which had begun in an alliance of whigs and tories became a whig victory from which it at first appeared that all true tories must stand aloof the whigs held that a bad king had no rights and said as much william took the government into his hands at the invitation of the peers who advised that a convention parliament should be summoned the surviving members of some of charles the second's parliaments were also called and gave the same advice on february first sixteen eighty nine this memorable assembly met at westminster it contained in the lower house a majority for the whigs who meant to change the succession but in the lords there was a tory majority still hampered by the difficulty of reconciling their theory of non-resistance and passive obedience with a revolution some were for appointing william regent for james while others argued that james was dead to the constitution and his daughter mary was already queen by hereditary right finally after much debate and many searchings of heart it was declared that james having broken the original contract between king and people and withdrawn himself out of the kingdom has abdicated the government and the throne is thereby vacant the scruples of the tories had been removed by william's announcement that he would go home unless they made him king and that he would not stay here as his wife's gentleman usher william and mary were promptly declared king and queen of england the revolution was a compromise the whigs secured the insertion into the constitution of their theory that government is a contract and not an heirloom in any family the tories were allowed to make believe that james had left them no other course by his flight after a brief discussion about the conditions on which the new rulers should be received it was decided to draw up a declaration of right which when the convention had decided to continue its own existence as a legal parliament was passed into law as the bill of rights this famous document asserted most clearly that the law was sovereign in england by enumerating the acts by which james had exasperated the nation and declaring them one by one to be illegal this was the solution of the problem which had pressed for an answer for so long henceforth there could be in no part of the constitution a claim to set aside a law when duly passed by the king lords and commons the right to act in virtue of a discretionary power 
which was summed up in the words salus populi suprema lex was to be heard of no more the motto which the stuarts had tried to affix to the english constitution must after the revolution be read lex suprema populi salus End of chapter 8chapter nine of king and parliament by george henry wakeling this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami william the third sixteen eighty nine to seventeen o two william prince of orange and stadtholder of the united provinces was now king of england not as mary's husband but together with her as the chosen successor of james he was just forty years old and had profited by his experience in a way that was to make him able to rule england and play the foremost part in european politics it has been said that william was never young he had been born and bred amid intrigues revolutions plots and had grown to manhood with the roar of french guns in his ears he was cold and hard in manner had wretched health and was personally unattractive his ambition had been to make himself and his beloved holland a power in europe and his chance had been so opportunely seized that he now hoped to add the name and resources of england to that league of augsburg which the restless louis the fourteenth had roused against himself in sixteen eighty six the pope the numerous german princes the emperor and the king of spain had long been anxious to check the daring monarch who swooped down now on the pyrenees now on italy now on the rhine or the sambre if william backed by the english nation and the english navy could lead the way there would be some chance of making headway even against so great a power as that wielded by louis the austere and forbidding nature of the new king was thus redeemed by one splendid passion love for holland and all that holland meant upon the map of europe but he was also a man of the most dauntless courage displayed alike on the field and in the council no military reverse could diminish it no political difficulties limit it and he needed it all for in england he found not enthusiasm or reverence for the deliverer but much treachery and more distrust only where he could make them see that he was working for their own immediate interests or when louis put a trump card into his hand by attack or insult did the english nation rally round william they were jealous of his dutch favourites they knew he loved the gardens of blue better than all the attractions of kensington and that he neither loved nor admired englishmen except indeed when he watched their corpses being piled beneath the walls of a french fortress but more than this england was so far as concerns her government in a stage of transition the king above the law was no more but the law above the king was not a condition of things which could be easily substituted for the old stuart theory in a few weeks parliament was strong and divided into two hostile camps of whig and tory the tories disliked william and felt ashamed of themselves for their revolutionary conduct the whigs hated the tories and thought william should follow their example the king had no mind to become a tool of the whigs and hoped to keep both in order by playing one party against the other but he could only do so by retaining some of his kingly power and thus he gave some sections of both parties a chance to combine against him nowadays the sovereign remains in the background while the ministries composed on strict party lines replace each other when the nation is dissatisfied with the party in power but this cabinet government was not in william's day more than an occasional expedient and the nation had not yet learnt its power to make its wishes felt thus parliament was more powerful than was just then desirable it was free from the king without being subject to the nation the king could only manage it by choosing ministers whom it would support thus beginning that system which is now always in operation government by a cabinet with a majority in parliament to pass its measures 
William was throughout his reign obliged to rush backwards and forwards from the Dutch frontiers to London, to work a machine without which he could do nothing, yet which frequently thwarted his best endeavours. His greatest difficulty, however, arose from his own insecure position. Few believed that with a divided nation and a greedy watchful enemy who announced his intention by word and deed to restore the fallen Stuart, William could long remain King of England. The Jacobites, as the adherents of James and his descendants were called, were powerful and alert. Every victory of France on the continent sent a thrill of treason through the English politicians who watched the great game. It is disappointing to find statesmen of all shades of opinion involved in this treachery, with very few exceptions, they corresponded secretly with James at Saint-Germain, where he now kept up regal state at the expense of the King of France. William knew and understood this, and it is not the least part of his title to fame that he not only refused to take vengeance, but actually contrived to work with men of whose letters to the exile he had copies in his hands. We may divide the reign into five periods. The first two years, 1689 to 1691, were occupied with the settlement of Scotland and Ireland, for James and Louis made a great attempt to keep William out of their path by giving him work in Ireland. This expedient would, if successful, have tied the king's hands very effectually, but all fears of a Jacobite Ireland were allayed by the Battle of the Boyne. From 1692 to 1695, William struggled unsuccessfully with his great foe on the continent, while he contrived to keep his government efficient at home by entrusting more and more power to the Whigs. The death of Queen Mary marks the close of this second period. The third consists of two years, 1695, to 1697, in which the power of France was successfully tired out, while the continued domination of the Whigs secured a strong war policy. With the Peace of Ryswick, 1697, the nation, led by Tories, ceased to support William, and in the fourth period, from 1697 to 1701, his parliaments became more and more unmanageable, while on the continent the tardy death of the Spanish king raised the greatest political problem of the age. Just as the French king was about to seize all those gains which the English jealousy against William was pouring into his hands, the death of James II occurred. The recognition of his son as king of England, which Louis promptly made, once more stung the English into a warlike temper. The fifth period, from 1701 to 1702, therefore shows William and his adopted country again at one, but with the last and fiercest struggle still to come, at this moment William died. The convention was, at the commencement of the reign, made into a legal and competent parliament, and continued in session. William wished to secure a moderate settlement of religion and finance, so that all faithful men might serve the state, and the state might be strong against France. But no such simple solution was possible. The Toleration Act, 1689, was passed, but gave only relief from penal laws to those Protestant dissenters who were prepared to take the oaths of allegiance and supremacy. No tests or penal laws were done away with. It was toleration and partial practice without the principle. There was no chance of comprehension, the reconciliation of Protestant nonconformists to the Church of England, though William wished it and convocation discussed it. The new oath of allegiance to William and Mary was made compulsory for all officers in church or state, and those who refused to take it, the non-jurors, as they were called, lost their posts. Sancroft, the hero of the resistance to James's declaration, led a party of non-juring bishops, and was deprived of his archbishopric. The revenue was settled on William, but Parliament considered it necessary to assert the principles of the Constitution by granting it only for one year at a time. 
the whig section now began to show a violent party spirit they tried to secure their own domination by punishing those who had abetted james's illegal acts especially those who had surrendered the charters of corporation to the last two kings this together with their resistance to the bill of indemnity which was to pardon the past caused a dissolution in march of sixteen ninety a new parliament with a larger preponderance of tories gave the king a firmer position and enabled him to some extent to hold the balance of parties his ministers were drawn from both sections the chief being godolphin shrewsbury nottingham halifax and danby meanwhile in ireland william's presence had become necessary james assisted by the french had landed there in march of sixteen eighty nine and at once the national feeling so long repressed by the system which cromwell established in the english and protestant interest sprang to life james was welcome as a roman catholic but the irish thought more of securing their independence of those who had taken their land and proscribed their religion than of restoring the king the protestants entrenched themselves in londonderry and enniskillen while the irish parliament set to work to undo the settlement of sixteen sixty londonderry was relieved in july sixteen eighty nine after one hundred and five days of siege and suffering but marshal schomberg whom william sent over with a small army failed to secure dublin thus in june sixteen ninety william who then landed in ireland with large reinforcements had to face the whole rebellion with james still at its head with such a coward as james however the issue could not long be doubtful the decisive battle took place near drogheda where james hoped to defend his position behind the boyne the river was crossed and the position was stormed on july first sixteen ninety james fled to france in craven haste the fall of limerick a year later completed the defeat of the irish again the country was given up to the protestant and english settlers who at once more than restored the system of sixteen sixty and utterly excluded the roman catholics from political power and social consideration the french who had for the moment a sufficient advantage at sea to make communication between england and ireland impossible had not managed to do so but though william was allowed to cross the error was partly retrieved by their occupation of the channel whence they drove lord torrington and his fleet after an engagement at beachy head june thirtieth sixteen ninety the english fleet though chased to the thames was still powerful and as the cause of james in ireland was already lost this reverse did little for the jacobites in truth there ought to have been such a french fleet in existence as would have kept william in england enabled james to hold ireland and succoured the jacobites in scotland for here too there was a party for the late king the covenanters forced in sixteen sixty to submit to the religious government they hated had risen on james's fall and in a convention march of sixteen eighty nine abolished episcopacy and proclaimed william and mary but the highlanders had been raised in the jacobite interest by graham of claverhouse better known as viscount dundee who roused the clans that hated the covenanting tribe of the campbells the great supporters of whiggery to fight for king james they won a battle at killiecrankie pass in july sixteen eighty nine but lost their leader and with the fickleness that celtic hosts have always shown they at once dispersed william endeavoured when this formidable rising was over to settle scotland by establishing the presbyterian form of church government his efforts to stop the persecution of episcopal clergy were in a great measure successful and redound to his credit though we cannot acquit him of all blame for the dastardly way in which the macdonalds of glencoe were murdered in the beginning of sixteen ninety two their chief had failed to comply with an order that all clans were to submit to the government by january first his submission a few days later was refused and william signed an order for the extermination of the clan which was carried out by brutal treachery instead of military execution 
by the summer of sixteen ninety one william was able to commence his great struggle with france the allies were already in arms and some fighting had taken place on various parts of the french frontiers the war is not interesting for it consisted so far as william was concerned in a stern struggle to keep his allies true to their promises and his parliaments to their interests and in marching out to meet the french armies which were personally conducted by louis so long as only sieges and no battles took place for when he could not hold a brilliant court round some starving garrison the french king left his generals to fight the king of england as william was a very unlucky commander the advantages he secured by diplomacy among his allies and at westminster were not infrequently lost when he faced a french army led by such a general as luxembourg but though often outmanoeuvred and sometimes routed william's true greatness always appeared more splendidly in defeat than in victory each summer a campaign took place and it was merely a question which could continue to put men and money into the business longest if the alliance broke up or the parliament refused supplies william must lose if france sickened with exhaustion he might win in sixteen ninety one william arrived on the frontiers only to find that the fortress of mons had passed into the hands of the french king april sixteen ninety one he left a parliament recently nerved to vote supplies by the burning of tynmouth which had followed the naval defeat of beachy head but a network of jacobite intrigue was spreading and while men like russell the seaman and marlborough the soldier were content with sending their expressions of duty and service to james the more active members of the party prepared plans for a rising while on the french shores armies were being collected for an attack upon england in may sixteen ninety two the french fleet was beaten and destroyed off cape laogue by russell who was not ashamed to write letters to james pleading the excuse that his professional reputation was at stake in the matter the descent upon england was thus put out of the question this was a sufficient revenge for the defeat at beachy head and france gave us little more trouble by sea meanwhile the french king and his court were watching the siege of namur which surrendered in june sixteen ninety two william who arrived too late to save it was then badly beaten by luxembourg at steenkerke august sixteen ninety two a second serious defeat at london in the following july brought the military prospects of the allies very low but in england matters were improving the factious spirit in parliament was shown when the whigs jealous of the tories proposed the triennial bill which would put an end to william's plan of getting a ministry to manage the parliament for as long as he could a general election every three years would give the party out of power a better chance the bill was passed but it was rejected by william who thus exercised his legal power of refusing to assent to a bill but the whigs were too strong to be neglected and as a compromise their champion somers was made lord keeper of the seal while the tory nottingham had to resign sunderland who was able to give good advice though unable to keep true to any principles suggested to william to make a united whig ministry and so keep his parliament in good humour the tories who had been in the ascendant for the last few years were losing ground they had no hearty belief in the war and their lack of energy in its conduct was a source of failure the whigs were also fortunate in securing at this time the strongest support they ever had the commercial interest of england not only those merchants whose ships had been lost when in sixteen ninety three the smyrna fleet was captured and its convoy dispersed by the french but all those who were concerned in the new financial expedients for it was an age of financial expedience a young and clever whig named montague had succeeded in raising loans for the war expenses by setting up the bank of england this meant that a body of men who negotiated the loans received from the government privileges by which they were enabled to secure a practical monopoly of the lucrative business of money lending the tories soon grew jealous of this power for it played into the whig hands by firmly attaching those men who lent the money to the government 
from which alone they could hope for payment they tried to secure similar advantages by what is known as the land bank this was an absurd scheme for making money by the wholesale lending or mortgaging of land but as many people wanted to borrow money and few to borrow land the bank of england won the day and soon became a powerful and important whig institution with montague chancellor of the exchequer and his financial success on every tongue the campaign of sixteen ninety four was opened nothing beyond an unsuccessful attack upon the french harbour of brest need be mentioned the whigs were able to secure the triennial act for william did not care to veto it a second time it looked as if the war would be waged with vigour and the party strife at home be ended by the domination of the whigs and the war party at this moment a great blow fell upon william his wife to whom he was sincerely attached died suddenly of smallpox in december sixteen ninety four this blow from which it seemed at first as if the king himself would scarcely rally for a time seriously menaced his political position mary's presence upon the throne of her ancestors had in fact been a rallying point for tories and high churchmen it had been the means of securing a larger number of adherents for the government both in and out of parliament than could have been hoped for had william been without the much-needed aid of her popularity sweet temper and good sense but the fall of danby one of the last surviving tory ministers who was at this time accused of receiving bribes from the east india company brought the whigs further to the front and their combination was strong enough to stand the strain the third period of the reign was the most successful for william godolphin was now the only tory minister mary's sister the princess anne who had been estranged from the court by the jealous intrigues of her friend the countess of marlborough was now reconciled to william though marlborough was in disgrace owing to his dealings with st germain great financial efforts were made and in august sixteen ninety five william had the satisfaction of retaking namur with this decided success to back him the king returned and dissolved parliament with a view to gaining a further whig success in the elections he made a real effort to secure personal popularity by making a progress through the country visiting large towns and staying in the country houses of important men the whigs were largely victorious at the polls and a liberal war grant followed but there was also plenty of work to be done at home a bill to make trials for high treason more humane by allowing the prisoner to have the same legal advantages as in other trials was passed the whig financiers somers and montague assisted by locke and sir isaac newton carried through a much-needed scheme for amending the coinage a sound currency is the condition of a sound commerce and the whigs who were supported by the moneyed interest replaced the old thin and clipped silver by new and thicker coins of full weight the french were not inactive in spite of the fall of namur and the death of their best general luxembourg louis was willing to assist any rising in england and james's illegitimate son the duke of berwick crossed the channel in disguise but he found that like the french the english jacobites wished to see the others make the first move there was no general rising and louis was too business like a plotter not to require something solid for his money early in sixteen ninety six however a plot was formed among some desperate men to attack and murder william when he went hunting at richmond fortunately a large party had to be enrolled in order to overcome his guards and there was a fair sprinkling of traitors among these would-be assassins the plot was betrayed and the result was all in william's favour an association was formed and swore to defend the king and maintain the succession of the princess anne thus the whigs won all along the line and in sixteen ninety seven william had a completely whig ministry a fairly loyal nation and a parliament ready to work with the government it was now clear that france was terribly exhausted by the gigantic efforts she had made to keep up the war along her entire frontier the king of england might therefore take advantage of this either to secure a peace or to strike a blow the former would disarm his foes at home who relied upon french assistance and william opened negotiations 
it was finally arranged that the french king should recognize william as king of england and anne as his successor he was to give up all that he had taken or conquered since the peace of sixteen seventy eight with the important exception of strasbourg which he insisted on retaining september tenth sixteen ninety seven the retention of this fortress was however a very trifle compared to the enormous accession of territory that louis hoped to acquire on the death of charles the second of spain it was now plain that the feeble life of that monarch was drawing to a close and europe was awed into a calm at the thought of the vastness of the issues at stake it was during this calm the fourth period of the reign that louis and william endeavoured to avert the threatening storm by a scheme for the partition of the hereditary dominions of the spanish crown there were numerous claimants but the great question lay between the imperial or austrian house and that of the bourbon the three royal houses of spain france and austria were united by various complicated intermarriages but so far as blood was concerned the dauphin had a clear right to the whole spanish dominion consisting of spain the indies sicily naples milan and the netherlands the danger of so great an accession of power to france had long been foreseen and by the treaty of the pyrenees sixteen fifty nine louis's wife had renounced all rights for herself and her descendants the dauphin's claim was therefore barred by international agreement the emperor leopold i had a claim through his mother which though not so good by pedigree was hampered by no renunciation a third claim passed to his daughter the electress of bavaria through her mother the younger sister of charles of spain but this was also barred by a treaty the houses of austria and france were each bound to resent so great a windfall coming to the other the young electoral prince of bavaria represented a third party whose accession to the crown of spain would at least keep out the direct heirs of both the rival powers and it was upon him that the great inheritance was settled by the famous first partition treaty arranged between william and louis english interests were concerned in as much as the union or close alliance of spain and france would be practically a veto upon english trade and commerce in the new world and the mediterranean louis was anxious to keep austria from the inheritance and to secure a further slice of european territory without fighting for it this arrangement therefore gave the indies spain and the netherlands to the bavarian prince french ambition was allayed by the offer of naples and sicily together with a small part of the north of spain Gipuzkoa. the archduke charles leopold's younger son received the duchy of milan this seemed a fair way out of the terrible dilemma but scarcely was it settled when the bavarian prince died of smallpox and the whole negotiation was rendered useless william had in his hands the whole management of these puzzling continental policies but his great efforts to settle the matter out of court were cramped by the condition of affairs at home no sooner was the peace of ryswick signed than the english nation ceased to support him the tension of the continental struggle once over a reaction began the national fear and jealousy of a standing army broke out fiercely there were three reasons why such a force was no longer dangerous as of old william was not james the second and had no quarrel with english laws the rapacity of louis made it absolutely necessary to treat with him sword in hand the mutiny act of sixteen eighty nine by which parliament granted special disciplinary powers over the army was annually passed and could be refused if the houses had cause to distrust those who maintained the army without such powers no army could be kept in order but a tory reaction was in progress and the magnificent forces of william were reduced to seven thousand men the favourite dutch guards were sent home though the king made a pathetic appeal to be allowed to retain them the expenses of the late war gave the tories a handle and they insisted on resuming large grants of crown lands which william had foolishly given in some profusion to dutch favourites men thought more of the taxation which would follow a fresh outburst of war 
than of making such war impossible by a bold policy the death of joseph of bavaria made necessary a second partition treaty in which louis found much advantage the archduke charles was made heir to spain and the netherlands which were both far enough from austria to make this increase of habsburg power unimportant louis still received for his son naples and sicily as well as milan which he hoped to exchange for lorraine a province long since practically his own by right of theft and occupation hardly was this arranged when the unhappy prince whose dominions were thus meted out died in the escurial november seventeen hundred he had been persuaded at the last by those who succeeded in gaining influence over his weak and tortured mind to make a will by which all his dominions were to pass to louis's grandson philip duke of anjou thus for a second time the labours and cares of months were thrown away and louis lightly breaking his treaty and his promise accepted the will the pyrenees as he proudly boasted existed no longer and all western europe had become the heritage of the bourbons to william this was a severe blow but the english people refused to share his alarm the partition with its addition to french power in the mediterranean was unpopular among the merchants and they had little fear of a future policy so united on the part of france and spain as to menace europe in general or english ships in particular this was the darkest moment in william's reign he had been tricked abroad humiliated at home and there appeared no way out of the difficulty moreover a succession difficulty seemed about to threaten in england itself anne's only son the duke of gloucester died in seventeen hundred and as william's health was daily failing a new scheme of succession was absolutely necessary if jacobite hopes were to be disappointed long ago it had been suggested that the crown should pass after the death of anne to the family of sophia electress of hanover who was a granddaughter of james i the act of settlement seventeen o one made this into law and thus completed the work of the revolution the crown was to be strictly hereditary in the hanoverian family provided they were protestants at the same time the independence of the judges was secured they were now to be removed only after an address from both houses of parliament and several other important constitutional provisions added but strong jealousy of the dutch king and his favourites was still shown the fears of william were however speedily justified by the treaty of Ryswick, dutch soldiers were allowed to garrison certain fortresses on the frontiers of the netherlands since spanish troops were neither efficient nor trustworthy louis in seventeen o one occupied these barrier fortresses and thus once more showed his contempt for the public law of europe there was now no means of shirking the question of war the commercial interest was alarmed and party strife ran high the tories were not inclined to yield their position when the war feeling began they impeached four members of william's government and imprisoned some freeholders who presented the kentish petition in favour of war but for william though he had been obliged to yield his dearest plans and see his efforts thwarted fate had one triumph in store in september seventeen o one james the second died at st germain the french king had really only one more solemn engagement left to break he seized this opportunity to break it and ostentatiously recognized james son the pretender as king of england this was enough to complete the overthrow of the tories and to give william the enthusiasm he wished to rouse parliament was dissolved amid national clamours for war against the french the whigs who gained the advantage at the polls voted supplies and passed a bill to secure the protestant succession once more the king had the english behind him but for william there was to be no part in the mighty struggle which was now to break the power of his foe and raise english arms and an english general to the highest pinnacle of military glory a fall from his horse stretched him on a bed of sickness from which he never moved at the very moment when one animated by a lifelong passion for war against france would have most cared to live 
William breathed his last at Kensington on March 8, 1702. End of chapter 9chapter 10 of king and parliament by george henry wakeling this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami Anne, 1702 to 1714 Anne, the younger daughter of james the second by his first marriage became queen on william's death by the express terms of the revolution settlement she was likely to be popular for she was a Stuart and yet a sincere member of the anglican church the tories would see in her a representative of the family whose misdeeds they were so anxious to forgive the whigs would approve of a queen succeeding by laws framed against the enemies of england's liberties she was a good woman without much will of her own thus it was easy to influence her and it was necessary for those who wished to secure power to do so for she retained a good deal of the importance in politics which had belonged to her predecessors she sat in the council and the ministers were her nominees or the nominees of those who worked upon her feelings the constitution was as we have seen changing a time was coming when the sovereign would be obliged to choose ministers trusted by the commons and the country the existence of parties had forced william to do so this was becoming even more necessary in anne's reign indeed her greatest change of ministers in seventeen ten was the result of a national and party agitation which carried the queen along with it this presents a great contrast to the early days of the period when the stuart kings had endeavoured to maintain ministers in opposition to the movement of the time the extension of this system was destined in the end to solve the problem of english government but meanwhile the fact remains that anne was sufficiently her own mistress to be unwilling to make changes except under pressure thus her easily led nature became a most important political matter her personal influence was perhaps heightened by the fact that her husband prince george of denmark was a man of no political weight there was nothing in him according to charles the second who professed to have tried him drunk and tried him sober the reign is much less puzzling than that which preceded it three main problems the european question the position of parliament in the state and the permanence of the revolution settlement seem to come to a clear issue an issue whose importance is none the less on account of its clearness the position of france on the continent remained to be determined it was a problem which had occupied the minds of statesmen since the end of the thirty years war in sixteen forty eight louis the fourteenth had first tried to seize the netherlands and been checked by the triple alliance and the peace of aix-la-chapelle he had next tried to punish the dutch but had been forced to desist at the peace of nijmegen his ambition still unsatisfied by his gains had then been confronted by a european coalition which finally bound him by the peace of ryswick now was to come the war of the spanish succession which was to break his proud spirit and rescue the continent from the spectre of french domination which had haunted the imagination of europe for fifty years this foreign war carried the second problem with it whigs and tories could not fight out their party struggle upon the question of jacobitism for the pretender never wavered in his allegiance to rome and most tory statesmen knew that a roman catholic king was out of the question even if a son of james the second might otherwise have been desirable but the whig war and the whigs who carried it on the dissenters who were still the friends of the whigs the moneyed men who supplied the whig exchequer these were always open to the tory attack the reign of anne thus became a period of keen party struggle complicated at every step by the military question on the continent a struggle carried on by any and every means at the termination of which the great constitutional change had been brought far on its way for with a weak woman on the throne it became only a battle of ins and outs 
of those who held power and those who wished to supplant them those who won must do so by having parliament on their side a pale reflection of such a struggle is witnessed now in our everyday political life the difference is that now the whole nation with its millions of voters and its hourly newspapers watches and finally decides the struggle at the polls whereas in those days though pamphlets issued rapidly from whig pens and tory pens it took as many days as it now takes hours for the real truth concerning the parliamentary debates to penetrate to the ears even of the cultivated classes the party that was out of power had to raise a cry sufficient to influence those few who had votes it had also to secure the queen's ear by means of those who were about her yet after the strides made in the direction of cabinet government footnote this means that the ministers are chosen entirely from the leaders of the party which has a majority in parliament and resign directly they lose that majority End footnote. between the revolution and the accession of george i the bringing of the will of the nation to bear on these matters was only a question of time the control of government had passed forever from the hands of the personal monarch it was bound eventually to pass to the majority of the nation one more question which had agitated england for a long time was also to come up for solution the jacobites hoped that though anne might be permitted to reign no german prince would ever succeed to the throne of the stuart house the hanoverian succession was the law of the land but whether it would be converted into a fact was in grave doubt during the last few years of anne's life between a foreigner and a roman catholic the choice was not an easy one with these three points before us the european crisis the party struggle and the succession dilemma the reign may be divided into three periods in the first seventeen o two to seventeen o eight the european question was foremost the national enthusiasm set the war going and the genius of marlborough made it successful the queen was completely under the influence of the wife of her great commander the whigs secured a majority in parliament and the ministers were chosen from among them louis was beaten on all sides and sued for peace which was at first refused in the second period seventeen o eight to seventeen ten the strife of parties at home is all-important wearied by the long war the nation refused to support marlborough as they had refused to support william the danger seemed over the influence of the duchess was undermined and queen anne ceased to take pleasure in the society of a brawling woman in a wide house a tory reaction occurred churchmen raised their voices against toleration and the foolish prosecution of one of them gave away the dignity of the government who their popularity being already gone could not long hope to retain office the struggle ended in a victory for the tories and thus incidentally for the principle of party government a tory ministry was soon appointed and in the third period seventeen ten to seventeen fourteen the revolution settlement trembled in the balance peace was made with france a peace perhaps necessary perhaps just yet in terms far less glorious than our victorious armies were considered to have earned the tory ministers plotted for a tory triumph perhaps for a stuart restoration the death of anne however found this ministry divided by a quarrel between its leaders and the whigs were able to obtain sufficient influence in the council to secure the succession of george i the war of the spanish succession seventeen o two to seventeen thirteen was waged mainly in three separate quarters first on the eastern side of france in the netherlands along the rhine and the borders of bavaria and austria here marlborough and his dutch allies had to succour the emperor and to drive louis from the netherlands which they had to regain foot by foot secondly in italy where eugene a prince of the house of savoy faced the french armies sent into the milanese duchy and endeavoured to prevent them from reaching austria by the tyrolese passes thirdly in spain itself 
where the english with their spanish and portuguese allies endeavoured to drive philip v from his newly acquired throne and to place the archduke charles the candidate of the allies in his place this was the ostensible purpose for which the war was being waged though it turned into a struggle to keep france from attacking the empire and the netherlands as well as from obtaining a commanding position in north italy the spanish campaigns always remained of secondary importance as william had died when war was popular there was no delay in taking up the struggle marlborough took command of the allies in the netherlands and war was formally declared in may seventeen o two anne was still as much as ever under the influence of this great man and his wife the queen allowed her favourite to call her mrs morley and in the familiar intercourse between the friends the duchess was mrs freeman the ministry comprised both whigs and tories marlborough and godolphin to whom the former was related by marriage being the leading spirits soon however it became clear that the tories loved neither the war nor those who were conducting it and they gradually were eliminated from the administration nottingham left office in seventeen o four and the whigs sunderland and somers soon appeared in the ministry the elections in seventeen o five were in favour of the whigs and the gradual stiffening of the whig element in the government reflected their gains in parliament thus for the first period of the reign the war policy went smoothly enough at home it will be well therefore to describe the main features of the military struggle the first necessity for marlborough was to check the french advance toward the dutch frontier for louis had already possession of most of the spanish netherlands in seventeen o two the english general was occupied with the siege of several fortresses in order to construct the desired barrier liege was captured and in seventeen o three he took bun thus stretching his line considerably toward the middle rhine louis's main object however was not to expend strength on this frontier where english and dutch stood firm between eugene in italy and marlborough in flanders lay a great tract of country in which louis's allies the bavarians were for the moment dominant it was therefore the object of the french to send forces through this great gap and attack the emperor in his hereditary dominion of austria he was the weakest member of the coalition and if louis could seize vienna as he had seized strasbourg he could dictate terms to one at least of the allies prince eugene won the battle of cremona in seventeen o two and prevented the french who held milan from pouring troops through the tyrol to austria but the french attack was soon after made in the centre where marshal tallard made a dash for the valley of the upper danube in seventeen o four the king of france however had to deal with a man whose ordinary calm common sense flashed into genius when a campaign or battle was to be worked out or fought marlborough saw through the plan and determined to defeat it he executed a rapid movement toward the upper danube valley and joined prince eugene near ulm together they advanced to attack the enemy and at blenheim a little village on the left bank of the danube a crushing defeat was inflicted upon the french and bavarians france never recovered the blow during the war the whole electorate of bavaria fell into the hands of the allies the empire was saved in seventeen o five the chief interest of the fighting lies in spain the earl of peterborough captured and held barcelona and the entire district of catalonia declared for charles meanwhile in seventeen o four the english fleet which had already seized a great squadron of spanish treasure ships in vigo bay took gibraltar under the leadership of sir john rook and sir cloudsley shovel in seventeen o six the allies triumphed on all three theatres of war marlborough broke into the french lines and crushed their armies a second time at ramillies may twenty third securing the netherlands and occupying brussels antwerp ghent and bruges the french still held the barrier fortresses chief of which were mons tournay and lille but they were obliged to keep to their own frontier instead of menacing that of holland in the same year eugene succeeded in winning a victory at turin 
and thus prevented a diversion in favour of Louis in North Italy. The Empire, Holland, and Italy were now safe. It remained to see if the Allies could seat their candidate in Spain. Here, too, there was success in that year. Barcelona was retained, Madrid was entered, yet the obstinate hostility of the Castilians was destined before long to render the position of the Allies in Spain quite untenable. Portugal was on their side, having been secured by the Methuen Treaty in 1703, by which England consented to receive Portuguese wines at a less duty than French ones. This, though a useful alliance, had its disadvantages, in that Englishmen took to drinking port instead of claret. But in spite of the gain of Portugal on one side of Spain and of Catalonia on the other, there still remained the all-important central provinces, whose animosity to the Allies and their candidate Charles could not be overcome. In 1707 the Duke of Berwick beat the Allies in the Battle of Almanza, and confined them strictly to the small district round Barcelona, which had been true to them all along. There was little hope of a final triumph in Spain. But Marlborough's career of victory went on unchecked. Baffled in their attack on Italy and on Austria, the French in 1708 made a vigorous effort to recover their hold on the Netherlands. But Eugène joined Marlborough, and a third signal victory was placed to the credit of the Allies at Audenarda, July 11, 1708. The capture of Lille, the leading frontier fortress of France, soon followed. Meanwhile, in Scotland, the oft-raised question of a union with England had been settled at last. All through the century since James I's useless attempt, the question had lain open. There were two great difficulties. The Scots absolutely refused all along to have anything to do with an Episcopal church. The wretched failure of the Stuarts to force this upon them had been recognized by William as definite and never to be renewed. The separation of the two countries in church matters had been made absolute. Clearly, then, any political union must be one of state and not of church. Here the difficulty lay in matters commercial. English and Scottish merchants were not on good terms. The Scots had to suffer the burden of the navigation laws as fully as if they had been Dutchmen. A parliamentary union might also be resisted by patriotic Scots, who liked to think of days when a handful of their race had beaten back the Plantagenet attack. But there would not be much trouble. If religion were divided and commerce shared, the union was likely to be easily accomplished. Under the rule of Cromwell, Scotland had been united to England, and then all commercial restrictions had been removed. This free exchange ceased when, at the Restoration, the Scots Parliament regained its independence. They had, therefore, now to choose between independence and free trade. A scheme proposed by one Patterson in the reign of William III, by which Scots were to secure a foremost place in the commercial world by colonizing the Isthmus of Darien and making it a depot for trade of East and West, had failed miserably. The Spaniards, whose rights they invaded, and the climate which they thought much better than it proved to be, combined to kill off the colonists. This, together with the jealousy shown toward the enterprise in England, was enough to make a wider breach more probable than a closer union between the two nations. But the Scots took advantage of the coming succession problem to make Englishmen think less of Scottish commercial rivalry and more of Scottish political union. Their parliament in Edinburgh declared in 1703 that though they would have as sovereign after Queen Anne a descendant of the Electress Sophia, yet their nominee should not be the same as England's unless their religion and trade were secured. This act of security was indeed a skilful trick to bring the English to terms. Commissioners were named to discuss a union of the two realms as soon as the northern kingdom threatened to sever the union of the two crowns, which had been a fact since 1603. The terms finally adopted were those we have suggested. Their religion was secured, their commerce made free. Their legal system remained to bear witness, if necessary, to their ancient independence. Scottish members to the number of 45 were to sit in the House of Commons, 
while sixteen peers were to be elected by the whole body of nobles to represent them in the house of lords thus ended one of the greatest difficulties of the seventeenth century we have seen how it baffled the wit of james i brought charles and laud to war and their system to overthrow it had given occasion for the display of the cynical indifference of charles the second and the bigoted brutality of his brother now prosperity and peace were to reward the scots for a century of bloodshed and persecution taking advantage of some considerable discontent when the independence of the kingdom was lost the french and the pretender tried in seventeen o eight to create a diversion by a jacobite rising in scotland but the pretender was delayed by the measles and the french fleet was dispersed by the vigorous measures of admiral bing far from being recalled to defend england marlborough was winning his fourth wonderful victory in september seventeen o nine by crushing marshal villard at malplaquet mons fell and the power of france was broken but this series of victories was over in the second period of the reign the government was to be defeated at home though victorious abroad for some time the tory party though weak had been working to recover influence they were led by robert harley an ambitious and unscrupulous statesman who with henry st john better known afterwards as lord bolingbroke represented a tory opposition to marlborough and the war the national feeling was now too important to be neglected and every shift in it was eagerly watched by the tories they were not slow to note that the war in spite of all its brilliant moments was steadily waning in popularity the taxation necessary to support it was heavy and it was loudly asserted that marlborough and the whigs continued the war because it kept them in power there were some grounds for such an assertion more than once louis had proposed to negotiate for a peace he had even offered to give up assisting his grandson in spain to give the dutch a number of barrier fortresses and to banish the pretender but the allies were not content they insisted that the french king should help them to drive his grandson from spain they asked a half-conquered foe to join the allies who had beaten him this was too much and france was stirred to enthusiasm by the imposition of terms which amounted to a national insult this failure to make peace when it was offered on fair conditions exasperated many and caused a tory reaction but another event in sixteen o nine had even greater effect a high church clergyman named dr sacheverell attacked the whigs and dissenters from the pulpit and went the length of publishing his sermons he spoke of the perils of the faithful among false brethren and described these latter in terms so clear that no one could mistake them the government actually impeached this preacher which was very foolish for it gave him popularity among a far larger number of people than those who read the sermons in question the man who had attacked and been attacked by the unpopular whig government became a hero among tories and churchmen and the tories gained from the enthusiasm which sacheverell roused against the whigs meanwhile harley was securing an ally at court whose services were more important still mrs masham his cousin was quietly gaining an influence over the mind of anne which was soon to supplant that of the duchess the queen was tired of this tyrannous woman and welcomed the more gentle sway of the new favourite thus with a tory influence supreme at court and a tory enthusiasm spreading in the street the crisis of the war in seventeen ten when louis's proposals were again refused at gertrudenberg led to a clean sweep of the whig ministry the queen had already refused to appoint marlborough captain-general for life the tories came into power and in the following year the great duke and his wife were dismissed from their offices no pains were spared by the tories to secure this triumph they accused marlborough of peculation under circumstances which do them little credit they also secured the services of pamphleteers foremost among them was dean swift the greatest prose writer of the age 
in the conduct of the allies he attacked the war policy and endeavoured to undermine the support which the whigs possessed in the commercial interests of the nation england he urged was getting terribly into debt in order to preserve dutch towns whose citizens would repay her by underselling english merchants we were fighting for our rivals not for ourselves our interest in the war was slight yet we had become a chivalrous power willing to fight other people's battles all over europe language like this had a great effect the tory ministry marked its succession to power by an attack upon the dissenters they passed the famous bill against occasional conformity it forbade men to receive the sacrament merely to qualify for office and then go back to their dissenting meeting-houses the tories hoped thus to exclude the dissenting element from the town corporations and through them from parliament but the greatest achievement of the new ministers was the ending of the war by the peace of utrecht they had come to power as a peace ministry protesting against the war and the war-makers they now put an end to the struggle the claimant for whom the allies were fighting the archduke charles had become emperor about the time of the accession of the tories to office their task was therefore easy it was absurd to suppose that spain was to be wrested from louis and handed to the emperor charles had been chosen as king when it was improbable that he would ever become emperor it therefore remained to find another candidate and begin the war afresh or to make peace to leave philip v on the throne of spain was certainly to give up an essential point but as there was no one else and as the spaniards were not likely to accept any one else it was a not altogether bad solution louis therefore had the satisfaction of securing spain for his grandson and added a solemn engagement that the crowns of france and spain should never be united for the benefit of any one who might still believe in solemn engagements he acknowledged the hanoverian succession banished the pretender and restored to the dutch their barrier fortresses english merchants obtained some limited trading rights in the spanish indies finally while england kept gibraltar and minorca her colonial gains in the eighteenth century were foreshadowed by the acquisition of newfoundland and other portions of french north america the netherlands and the italian provinces of milan sardinia and naples went to the emperor the duke of savoy obtained sicily while louis retained strasbourg thus by seventeen thirteen the european question was settled and the triumph of party government had begun in england it is noticeable that tory peers were created specially to make a majority in the house of lords in order to prevent opposition to the peace in the third period of the reign the succession question loomed large anne was in bad health the electress sophia was over eighty years of age and thus there was a near prospect of two rapid changes in the occupancy of the throne if the latter should outlive the queen fortunately she died a few weeks earlier her son george elector of hanover was about fifty years of age and a good soldier but beyond this little was known about him the party spirit was so completely dominant in england that the tory leaders may well have doubted whether such a king would be accepted by the nation harley now earl of oxford and his colleague bolingbroke were generally supposed to have intended to restore the pretender since they wrote letters to him perhaps they were only trimming as better men had done before but it seems that bolingbroke at least had gone very far in the direction of conspiring for the restoration of james the third by force of arms it is clear they had little to hope from the legal heir to the throne who was sure to place power in the hands of the whigs fortunately for england these two statesmen quarrelled just before anne died oxford was dismissed the question arose who should succeed him as lord treasurer some of the whig lords promptly seized this opportunity of the queen's illness forced their way into the privy council and secured the appointment of the earl of shrewsbury a firm supporter of the hanoverian succession this decided the matter queen anne died on august first seventeen fourteen and the elector george lewis was proclaimed king of great britain france and ireland defender of the faith the days of the stuarts were over personal government by the monarch was now to become obsolete 
under two foreign kings who knew nothing and cared nothing for english politics for the first time in the history of the realm the sovereign was to become a secondary person in the governance of the land where he reigned but did not rule his place was to be taken by the prime minister the chief of one of the party cabinets which were for the future to be the rule and not the exception the next period of english history should be called the reign of walpole and not labelled with the comparatively insignificant names of the first two georges the ancient struggle between king and parliament had reached its end end of chapter ten recording by pamela nagami in encino california august two thousand seventeen end of king and parliament a d sixteen o three to seventeen fourteen by george henry wakeling